I recently responded to a post of a case that was posted at a DAE connection by a very good endodontist, Dr. Brett Heber. And uh, Brett's case uh, was a case of a young female patient who had root canal therapy in his office and this patient had a large vertical lesion. The tooth was necrotic, it was a molar, a lower molar. And uh, Brent did a case of cast hydroxide therapy and then filled the tooth and then later on the furcation area healed completely proving that once again that endoperio lesions that are primarily endo and secondary perio can heal with endo alone and that uh, you don't have to necessarily fill in, in lateral and vertical canal with a radio opaque cement to get healing. You just have to clean the main canal adequately. So anyway that created a little question and the question uh, was posed by one of the dental students down in Florida, his name is Alex and who's also following the forum and Alex's question was that he didn't quite understand what I meant by not necessarily having to fill a lateral and furcal canal for, with a radio opaque cement to get healing. And I thought this is a great question and that it would be a nice question for our Friday questions this week. So what am I talking about here? Well, first and foremost, the concept here is that if a periodontist had seen this case with that large of a periodontal lesion, not so much in a young patient like that 11 year old, but an older patient, that case would have very likely ended up being extracted and replaced with an implant. And the reason for that is because we know that periodontal lesions that are furcal lesions don't fare well in the long run. It's very difficult to graft them and guide a bone regeneration. Tissue regeneration is unpredictable at best in these types of cases. But when the furcal bone is broken down and because of endodontic sources such as infected pulp inside the tooth, that then releases its microbes through a furcal or a coronal lateral canal into the furcal area. The bone loss that occurs in the furcal area is no different than a peripheral lesion, except that the source is inside the tooth uh, and released through a lateral or furcal canal into the furcal area of the tooth. As we know, the breakdown of the bone in these areas is always a result of a inflammatory reaction by the host to some of the gram-negative microbes as well as the other microbes in the area that release a number of chemokines and uh, this uh, inflammatory process is what results into bone loss. If we do remove the source of this infection, which is the microbes inside the tooth that are pouring out through this lateral furcal canal, then as long as this infection has not lasted too long so that the endodontic lesion has become an independent and separate periodontal lesion, hence that old definition of primary end or secondary perio, as opposed to a true endoperio lesion in which the endo and perio are combined due to a long-lasting endodontic lesion that has been kind of ignored and that has resulted into furcal breakdown or other kinds of lateral breakdown of the um, of the attachment and secondary and subsequent colonization of the biofilm and calculus formation on the root surfaces leading from endo to perio and uh, that that's that that's a separate problem but when the problem is primarily endo once you address the source of the problem with endo the perio will heal however what do i mean by this idea of just cleaning the main canal lateral uh, as opposed to the lateral and the focal canals what I was trying to say here is an age-old argument that had been happening since the 70s and the 80s between some of the big names in endodontics, uh, such as Dr. Shoulders program, the Boston University School, against pretty much the rest of the establishment of endodontics, which included the Penn and the Midwest schools, Dr. Wine, and Grossman, Seltzer, Bender, all of those other people that had more so of a biological component or rather biological aspect of endodontics. What I'm trying to get at is most of the studies that we have about endodontics show that the success rate is not dramatically changed if your obturation or instrumentation is within a millimeter or so of the end of the root. In fact, some sugar and studies shows even within two millimeters, it doesn't really make a difference. But let's assume within a millimeter of the root end that your instrumentation uh, would your obturation would suffice for getting a predictable success rate. So what happens to that additional, you know, half a millimeter to a millimeter? In those cases, the irrigants and the disinfectants are obviously every time you're going down the canal, the hypochlorite that's in the canal is going to get a little bit of a puffing, a little bit of a positive pressure from that action. And a combination of your sodium hypochlorite 
and as well as your chelating agents are going to try to keep this uh, uh, area clean. So let me just quickly draw this for you to see what I'm talking about. Imagine you have a tooth that has caries and the caries infects the pulp and now you're going through a process of necrosis and now the pulp is necrotic and all of this uh, previously healthy pulp is no longer there and it's become uh, nutrients, if you will, for the microbes that are now growing in there. Normally, this microbes would, in the absence of any furcal or large lesions or any, actually, any uh, exit points, it will be moving down to the end of the root where it will get out through the apical part of the tooth and cause a periapical lesion. And the periapical lesion is essentially your immune system responding to the microbial byproducts and some live bacteria that gets out through the end of the root and mounting a response. That response re essentially results into some bone loss, osteoclastic activity. And the reason for that is because you need to get rid of the bone so that you can actually bring the immune system in there to mount a humoral as well as a cell mediated response against these microbes. So that bone loss is a consequence of our immune system's response to these microbes. So wherever the source of microbes are present, whether at the apex through the large periapical foramen or in the presence of furcal lesions or even lateral canals on the side, you're going to end up having a similar type of bone loss, which is the exact same thing that happens at the apex would occur at the furcation. Now, if you are able to remove through root canal therapy those microbes that are inside the tooth that are the source of the microbes that are mounting the immune response, right? Uh, then the immune response will subside. The same thing that happens at the apex will then happen coronally at the focal area of the tooth. So there is really no difference in that way. So the lesions will go away in time once the source of the, of the uh, bone loss, which is the microbial antigens and the gram-negative bacteria, is gone. And that's what I was alluding to. But how can you then say you don't have to fill these lateral canals? Because first and foremost, the, if we take a look and we kind of blow up this lateral canal here, what we see is we see a situation in which you have a part of the dentin and then you have a little opening and of course all of you probably remember what how a lateral canal is formed from histology essentially as the epithelial root sheath uh, drops down Hertwig's epithelial root, root sheath drops down and dentin is formed from outside in any breakdown in this root sheath results into an area where there would be a lack of odontoblasts and that becomes a hole that once the formation of the, you know, once the tooth erupts into the mouth, that hole continues and that would be a, what we call a lateral uh, canal. And depending on its location, it would be either a lateral canal, a furcal canal, or if it's further down towards the root end where these kinds of problems occur more often, that would be an accessory canal. And the reason why you see more of that in the apical part of the tooth is because that is essentially the channels through which the vasculature, the neurovascular bundle, enters the tooth and remember as the tooth forms from outside in those areas are trapped and they become uh, holes for accessory and lateral canals usually it's one one main canal but there's oftentimes multiple and that creates that kind of a lateral canal all right so the situation that we have is one in which we have a sea of bacteria out here inside the pulp and the byproducts will obviously flow through the lateral canal and then they mount an immune response out here into the PDL. So this side is the PDL and this side is the pulp. Once we go ahead and clean out the source of bacteria through a process of root canal therapy, right? So the question really becomes what happens to the microbes that are actually inside the lateral canal itself? Since lateral canals, furcation canals and so on are invisible to us and we don't see them and we hardly ever get a chance to put a file in them so that we can clean them, the, the way we clean those is through our chemo, the chem, chemo part of the chemo mechanical uh, instrumentation. So therefore, what 
we need to do here is we need to have an understanding that this part of the canal is essentially a function of our irrigants. And that's one of the main reasons why it's so important to use chelators and decalcifying agents in your chemomechanical instrumentation because as we are instrumenting and scraping, there's no doubt that we create a smear layer and that smear layer can potentially block these accessory and lateral canals and if the, that occurs too early, then our irrigants and disinfectants do not get a chance to fully clean out these lateral canals. Now, this does not happen at such significant rate that the body is unable to deal with, with the uh, burden of any microbes that could be left in there. But, uh, and the reason I know that is because if we look at the HES plates of teeth, we see that there's so many lateral canals and accessory canals in teeth, and yet clinically, we don't see them filled as often, and yet endodontic therapy has such a high success rate, 94, 95% based on uh, the most of the studies. And patients are asymptomatic during these times. And the reason for that is first and foremost, if you have a lateral canal that is vital, there's absolutely no reason to push any sealer or cement into it. The tissue that is in a lateral canal, if you're doing root canal therapy, can remain vital based on many the work of many people in the past and even historically and even more currently, uh, Dr. Ricucci's work is showing us that that can happen. Now, the only real question is question of necrotic cases. What do you do with the lateral canals? And that's where the chemomechanical irrigation comes in. So the lateral canal itself is not going to be mechanically cleaned. It is only going to be chemically cleaned. And in order for it to be chemically cleaned adequately, then you need to kind of use chelating agents. And the most important part of your success is going to come by first and foremost, reducing and removing all of the microbial burden or, you know, as much of it as possible inside the tooth and uh, especially surrounding and around an area where there might be a lateral accessory canal and then you will have good success rate. So the goal of endodontic therapy is not necessarily to clean inside a lateral canal because we frankly can't. The goal of endodontic therapy is to clean and disinfect the main canal adequately, use adequate irrigation in large volumes of a uh, solution that is very much disinfecting and can also, you need to also use a chelating agent to remove the smear layer so those tubules through diffusion can get cleaned out and disinfected and then you're going to have successful results. So it's usually when you see a case that is failing, that's been unlikely treated and is failing around a lateral canal, the um, vertical condensation uh, folks have been saying that, oh, it's, it's failing because of the lateral canal. But it's not because of the lateral canal that is failing. It's actually because the lateral canal is near an area in, uh, near the main canal where there's microbes persisting. So the source of the bacteria that is causing that failure is inside the root canal. And it's essentially uh, draining on the outside and causing the failure because of that. Anyway, so that's what I meant to say from uh, that case. I hope this was uh, helpful to you to understand this dynamic between lateral canals and the importance of uh, cleaning the main canal as uh, a main determinant of success for you clinically as opposed to focus merely on lateral canals. This was really the source of a lot of arguments and um, disagreements back in the 1980s and 1970s between Dr. Childers' school of thought and the rest of the country as a whole. Uh, and uh, we could probably in a separate video talk about the politics of that and how is it that the vertical condensation message uh, became such the dominant message and how that worked out. And that, I think that itself requires a whole video, which I think is an interesting one. I hope this little information was helpful to you. And Alex, thank you for, for your question. And I hope this does answer the question to the extent that is possible. Keep in mind that you always remove the source of the bacteria inside the main canal, lateral accessory, and all these other fecal canals are just methods or means through which microbes can get out. If you fill a lateral canal, without having cleaned it, you still are going to have failure if you haven't fill, if you fill lateral canal, especially with the cement that will wash out without having uh, cleaned the main canal adequately, you will still have problems in the long run, especially sealers that are um, going to be washing out. And uh, with that, we will end up. I'm Alina Say, and let's save some teeth.